the world doesn't understand this man the way we do. We're the only two people who know who he really is. And that joins them together at first as they're heading off on their journey to find answers and ultimately finding out something about each other that they didn't anticipate. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where today's guest is Laura Dave, and we're going to be talking about her number one New York Times bestseller, The Last Thing He Told Me. I met Laura a few years ago when she was doing pre-production tour for her last novel, 800 Grapes. And more than once, I have found myself thinking of her when I open a bottle of wine and I think of 800 grapes. And I open up lots of bottles of wine, so you can imagine how many times I've been thinking of her. So welcome, Laura. It's so nice to see you again. It's so nice to see you, Carol. Thank you for having me. This is going to be so much fun. I've been looking forward to this all week. So we're talking about your first domestic suspense novel. Mm -hmm. So let's start with you telling us about the last thing he told me. You tell us. Well Absolutely. Well, the last thing he told me focuses on Hannah Hall, who is a newly married woman who has just relocated from New York to Sausalito, California, to live with her husband and his 16-year-old daughter. And it's going great. It's a little bit of uh, some... Uh, friction while she's getting used to being a new stepmother, but the family is blending. She's happily married. She's loving her new life in this floating home community uh, until the day that her husband's firm is raided and um, he disappears, leaving in his wake a note, protect her and nothing else. And as Hannah tries to pick up the pieces from that and figure out what to do next, she also is left in the position of caring for a 16 year old who wants very little to do with her. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where the book begins. And to have a child like that left behind, it's like, could you just take her too? Yeah. <laughs> <Never move> on. <laughs> because exactly. this is not going to be easy. Exactly. You, you nurtured the idea for this book a while, I think since 2012. Mm -hmm. Did you always know you were going to write it and that you held back? Or did you say, eh, I'm just playing around with this? So actually, it's even, it goes back even further than that, which is all the way back in 2003, I was really interested in the Enron trial mm -hmm. and what was happening. And I watched an interview with Linda Lay, the wife of Kenneth Lay, the CEO of the company. And in the interview, um, it was on NBC, and she said, my husband's done nothing wrong. And that really penetrated for me. And I started imagining a heroine of a book who found herself in the precarious position of believing one thing about her husband when the entire world was telling her something different. And that sort of percolated for years and years. Um, and simultaneously, I was interested in a Gloria Steinem quote I had heard that about how important it is to watch a woman become the hero of her own life. And I knew I only wanted to tell this story of a woman believing this about her husband if I could also root the book in something like hope, in something like heroism, not making the woman at its center a victim, but really giving her agency over her own fate. Mm -hmm. And this percolated and percolated. And in 2012, I started writing. Um, but it wasn't until I had my son in 2016 that I realized that Hannah's journey, that the journey here of her becoming a, a hero was also becoming the hero for a child. It was the primal journey of someone becoming a mother. In this case, a mother to someone she did not birth. It was really about chosen families and chosen motherhood. And um, that's when the journey concretized for me, the book concretized for me. And the last thing he told me that is sitting with you now um, and sitting behind me now was born. And, and I really found its, its heart. It's hard what to do, but you weren't working on this book. This is in the book you were contracted to do because I remember seeing a pre-production interview where you were talking to your editor. You talked about calling Mary Suruchi and say, hi, I have this other idea for a yeah. book. And it's that moment where I know editors will sit there and go, oh, really? Oh, I know that. <laughs> How nice. I was all expecting, you know, 800 grapes, you know, times six, you know, I was all ready for that book. And this is not like your other five titles. This is yeah. very, very different, but she gave you the green light. Yes. What was it like to make that call and say, hi, this is what I'm going to do? 
Well, you know, I have to say that one of the great blessings of my writing career has been my relationship with Mary Sue Rucci, my editor for the mm -hmm. last three books, including this one. And I was very nervous to make that call. And when I think about, you know, there's been so many amazing moments in the publication process, but the best moment for me of this book, truly, the number one moment was after Mary Sue read it because her opinion matters so much to me. She called, I have, the, I have, if you could see my arm, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. And she was like, this is the book. Like she, her enthusiasm and her response to it. She never, she never soft soaps me. I never get any sugar coating. So when she liked it and I knew we were going, that, that this was going to be the next book I put out, the relief I felt and the joy I felt was supreme because mm -hmm. without her enthusiasm, you know, I, I just I heard, you know, people talk about the voices you start hearing in your head, the longer, the longer you write. And now her voice is really in mine. So it was just this really great moment. And they're sitting on your shoulder as you're typing. Exactly. You stop typing. They start tapping. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like this is what exactly. you need to do. But when you've got that kind of relationship, <laughs> yes. it's to say, I'm going to take the leap with you. It's also yeah. knowing you're a really good writer and they knew like what you had done before, but okay, let's give her a chance. Yes. So what was the allure of setting, let's start with Sausalito, because yeah. have you spent time in Sausalito? I mean, I've been up there for a day or two. That's yeah. it. So I always, the thing that this book sort of does have in common with my previous novels is that I like writing about communities that are on the edge of the world in some way, mm. that find that leave its inhabitants to rely on each other. I almost just lost you, the whole computer just <laughs> Um, that leave its inhabitants to rely on each other in a way that only a small community on the edge of the world needs to. Mm -hmm. And the floating home community of Sausalito is very beautiful, very intimate, and all its inhabitants kind of know each other. And I thought, what an interesting place to have someone be, and I don't want to ruin anything with the book, so I won't mm -hmm. say a spoiler, mm -hmm. but... Owen and Bailey land there after a very tumultuous past. I'll just say that. Right. So um, what an interesting place to find yourself hiding from that past. Yeah. Um, and Hannah is walking into this unknowingly. And what does that say? And what is this community going to do for her? And how is it going to rally behind her? That's sort of how I found my way to Sausalito. We have spent a lot of time up there. I live in Los Angeles and we love Northern California. We go, we go to Northern California pretty much any opportunity we have. We're huge mm -hmm. fans of wine country, um, Big Sur, and San Francisco. Um, so I have spent a little bit of time in Sausalito. And when I started working on the book, I started spending more time there. Um, and actually just recently, because we are adapting this um, into a show, my husband and I, we went back up there and I gave him the tour of, this is Hannah's house. This is, I always imagine the actual places. So there's Hannah's house. I have Hannah's studio on Litho Street. I have all of it um, that we just went back and visited. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, so, okay. So when you're up there, the floating homes, mm -hmm. I just thought was such a great idea. Did you always want to live in a floating home or just when you saw the community, you think it's great? Because I thought, boy, that would be such a cool place to live. I think it probably would be a, a cool place to live. I haven't always wanted to live there, but I would like to spend some time there. And after spending a little bit more time, you know, um, in that area, it's so great. And the people who live there, um, you know, I don't want to obviously speak for anyone, but it feels like a very close knit community. And what a cool way to live waking up and outside your bedroom window is the Richardson Bay and um, from different angles, you have the mountains and you have all these amazing communities outside of San Francisco. It's just a really special place. Yeah. And the boat's rocking, boat's just yeah. a little bit of thing. And, but then if there's a storm or whatever, you all have to unite together because you yes. all need to leave. You all need yes. to. So it's one of those communities where you do have to be there for each other because something could happen. Something could happen, you know, disastrous. So you never, you've never lived on the houseboat though. Cause I, never I haven't. And, and I really love doing research. So I actually tried to rent one of the houseboats for a period of time, which is almost impossible to do. Um, it's very, they, almost never come up for rent and very infrequently even come up for purchase. So um, I didn't get to, I didn't get to live there. Um, but um, yeah. 
That's like so much fun. So yeah. much fun. So then Hannah's got this very interesting career as a woodworker. Yeah. What made you, and it's actually a different wood term. Yeah. What made you decide to give her that career? And did you do a lot of research into that? I did. So in 2012, it was shortly after um, I got married. I got married in 2011. And for a wedding present, um, good friends of ours gave us a wood turn bowl. It actually sits on my desk. So I have it here. Oh, wow. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Really it's, it's really beautiful and um, oh, elegant. Stunning. And I was so interested in, in the bowl and sort of in its history. And I learned about wood turning and I, I started learning about that this this very intricate piece um, came from one large piece of wood that someone turned on uh, a piece of a equipment called a lathe. And I was so interested in that. And I started doing more research and the patience that's required to be a wood turner, the skill, the perseverance, the, the physical strength, all of these different qualities seem to speak to family and what was required of a family and also what is required of someone in their own life when they're faced with a tragedy. So mm -hmm. I thought it would speak to it in kind of an interesting way. And that's how Hannah's profession was born. Yeah. And her pieces are so high end, like when yes. she's designing for people, it's mm -hmm. like, this is the table I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. And I just found that fascinating because it made me want to go out and see pieces like that. My husband um, works a lot with wood. He's built a ton of furniture for us. So I've really got to talk to him about this and see if he knows anything about it. He's on these woodworking forums and things like oh, that. Wow. But it's yeah. so much fun because I'll say, I really want this. But the problem is like, I'll also say, I really want Chase Lounge chairs, like new ones. Mm -hmm. And then they don't happen. And then yeah. I have really crappy ones because he says, I'm going to do them someday. I'm like, yeah, we're going to be sitting on the ground, you know, yeah. pretty soon. Really yeah. Funny. I love that. You also did a first person narrative here that gives yes. the book a very special feel because we're with Hannah the entire time. Did you always write it in the first person or is that something you went back to later on? So in early iterations of this, actually, Owen had a whole section in the book mm -hmm. um, where you were finding out what was happening with him while he was um, you know, after he disappears, while you see what's happening with Hannah and Bailey. But ultimately, I decided that this was really Hannah's story. And in a way, it was Bailey's story. And I imagine the entire book as a call and an answer. The mm -hmm. beginning of the book, um, one of the first lines Hannah says is Bailey. She's calling out to Bailey that, you know, dinner's ready. Um, and the last line of the book, which I won't ruin, is sort of the answer to that initial Mm -hmm. question in which she is mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to be there for her new stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I realized it was really their story. And to stay really close to that, I wanted to stay really close to Hannah's point of view. Mm. That's all, and it completely works. And then she gets to deal with ba Bailey, who is rather cantankerous. She's like yeah. this very difficult child. What made you decide to have it be a teenage girl in this role who were usually such a delight to be able to spend time with and so cooperative, especially when they get to be the stepmother, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I'm really rooting for you now, honey, you know? Yeah. Well, I love the idea of honoring chosen families mm. and this, you know, uh, there are so many ways that we come to motherhood, that we come to parenthood. Sometimes it's people we give birth to. Sometimes it's someone that we marry and they have a child. Sometimes it's an animal. You know, there's so many ways that we end up taking care of people in our lives and um, the people that matter to us. And I wanted to look at an unconventional way that someone might find their way into that important and intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think I made her, um, I can't remember, it's such a good question why I ultimately decided to make her a teen. I think part of it was that I wanted her to have all of her own ideas about who her father was and where her father might be so that the two of them were both locking heads over that and joining over that. Mm -hmm. You know, I had seen in literature and on television Often you see the relationship with a stepmother and a stepdaughter um, in competition for a father husband's love. Mm -hmm. And here they're not in competition at all. Mm -mm. They both know how much Owen loved them. And I want them to remain steadfast. I wanted them to remain steadfast in understanding his devotion. And the thing that sort of um, fuses them together is that they both feel the world doesn't understand this man the way we do. We're the only two people 
who know who he really is. And that joins them together at first as they're heading off on their journey to find answers and ultimately finding out something about each other that they didn't anticipate mm -hmm. and finding within each other something they didn't anticipate finding. So um, yeah, so that was part of the reason that I, I created the dynamic in that way. Yeah, and she's exactly the right age because yeah. she could go off on her own. Like she could disappear on her yeah. own someplace. If she was much younger, she yeah. wouldn't, if you would be in a complete panic, you'd be calling the police. The other way, you're just like, where did you go? Why did you do that to me or whatever? So it, it, it's that age and then older, they could have just walked out and been on their own. They would exactly. have just like, you know, bolted and stuff. So actually yeah. when I was thinking about 16 is like the perfect age yeah. because they're old enough to move, but not that you know, much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hannah reaches out to this old boyfriend for help. And I felt that this worked because it gave her a tie with the past, mm -hmm. but it's also someone she trusted. Yeah. And am I right on why Jake came into the picture? Because, you know, she's making this call to him and he's like, why are you calling me? Like, what's going on? I knew you'd, you know. So I think that sometimes when we're feeling desperate and tragedy often can make us feel desperate and confused and Hannah's left reeling by Owen's disappearance, we close ranks mm -hmm. and she didn't Jake is both the last person she wants to call and one of the only people that she can trust to call. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, when someone disappears in this fashion, I spoke with lots of lawyers to do research. Um, two lawyers in particular were helping me. And um, all of a sudden, you have all these new people coming into your life that you don't want there. Mm -hmm. FBI agents, US Marshals, the SEC, the DOJ, all these people are getting involved in this financial investigation of Owen's firm. And because Owen is missing, all of that heat is, is being directed at Hannah. Mm -hmm. And so there's not really the time or the energy to figure out who can help me in a new way. You sort of think about who in my orbit can help me currently. Mm -hmm. And she reaches out to her best friend, Jules, mm -hmm. who works at a paper in a sports, um, she's a sports editor, but that becomes someone that is helpful to her and can, can offer some solace. And Jake, while he's not a criminal lawyer, he is a lawyer and he is able to offer some legal guidance, put her in touch with people she needs. And also though, it raises the question, which I hope it raises for the reader, in what capacity exactly is he gonna be coming back into her life? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that creates a little bit of intrigue. Yeah, the intrigue and it's, he's also, I'm going to help you, but he also gives her this one line that gives her pause. And I yes. won't give anything away, but there's this yeah. one line and she's like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously, exactly. this is what's going exactly. on? No, I didn't he's see not, that. He's not warm and fuzzy for sure. No. And he's going to just plunge in and, and to make her like question everything that's going on a little bit more like, okay, yeah. this is your security blanket, you know, here on earth. Yeah. Which character was the easiest to write? Well, it's such a good question. Um, I love that question. I was betting it was Hannah, but could I be wrong? I don't know. You know, maybe Jake, and maybe it's just because you were just talking about him, mm -hmm. but I knew who that guy was. I had a really um, firm grasp on him. Um, and actually Bailey uh, was pretty easy to write. I, I'm blessed to have um, uh, three godchildren and um, they're all teens. And I have watched them, um, uh, be teens in close proximity. And I really just had a really strong feeling about who she was. Uh, again, she is surly and challenging, but she's not, a, she's not mean. She's mm -hmm. just very much a teenager mm -hmm. and trying to deal with unbelievable tragedy here. And also, um, the type of uh, tragedy that someone her age should not have to deal with, especially mm -hmm. considering she lost her mother young for her father then to disappear. It's almost too much. And yet I wanted her to rise to a good place in spite of that. I just had a firm grasp on her. Mm -hmm. Hannah was actually probably trickier for me because, um, and Owen was trickier for me because especially in the early years of working on this book, and I would pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down. But I had a very definitive idea about what their trajectory would be together. Mm -hmm. And I had to let that go in mm -hmm. order to find the story I was really needing to tell here. And letting it go was hard because it involved um, reimagining different aspects of who they are. And it involved a sacrifice um, that I really didn't want to make, but I, I think I had to make. 
Yeah. And it's like you're giving up the whole character, giving up his whole story. And yeah. you know, I like that story. Yeah. I like hearing his p- p- point of view. Mm-hmm. There are couple, there's a moment where I'm not going to give anything away that you see that again. You see yeah. how much you love doing that again. You really yeah. do. Um, Hannah at one point is challenged about why Owen could have left. And she says, someone without a choice is the one that would have left. They didn't have any other choice to do. And I thought that was such a great line because there's so many characters that, why are they really doing it? There's nothing else they can do. They've got to disappear or they're going to hurt you. They're going to hurt their daughter. They're going to hurt everybody. So that's the reason. And I just thought it was such a great line of, that's why he did it. He had no choice. Well, I think also when we're outside of something, it's easy to look at any situation and think, well, you could have chosen this and you could have chosen that. But when you're in the face of that kind of terror and despair that Owen and Hannah and Bailey, for that matter, are facing in this book, you'd feel like you don't have a choice. You feel like what you have to do in that moment is whatever needs to be done to protect your family. Mm -hmm. And Owen made the only decision he felt like he could make to protect his family. Yeah, this is what I have to do. There was like no other choice. You know, I love that the prologue takes on a different meaning once you finish the book. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say any more, but you're just going to get a different meaning. And I often read a prologue and I read and go, hmm, okay, what are they talking about here? Sometimes they're set in a different time frame. Sometimes they're set in whatever. But you realize that the author did write that for a reason. And now I've taken to going back and reading those at the end to sit there and see how it all ties together. Like, okay, this is what's going on. So when did you write the prologue? Did you write it at the end or did you go back and do that? Or was that written at the beginning? That was actually written at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, I always had this idea that Hannah was going to be in a position of trying to understand what she had missed. So when I'm writing a book, I never outline. I never know um, what's going to happen next. There's this great E.L. Doctorow quote um, that writing a novel is like driving at night. You can only see as far out as your headlights. Um, And I love that. And that's really how I approach writing. So what I knew going into this book was that Hannah was someone who was both a little bit forgetful, but also on the important things, prided herself for a variety of reasons having to do with her own primal injuries and her own past of not missing things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so destructive about Owen's exit is she is reeling trying to figure out what she missed Mm -hmm. about who he was trying to tell her he was or who he was trying to hide from her that he was. Um, So that prologue sort of came to me very naturally as did the first chapter of the book in which that note is left for her protect her, um, left by Owen. Beyond that, I didn't know what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And so I had that sense of discovery with Hannah, that sense of I'm gonna try to piece all of this together. And um, most of the book takes place in the present, but we have these chunks of the past of these memories that Hannah is coming to as things in the present day are reminding her of things in the past. And I knew that structure was gonna be in place. Um, But beyond that, I really didn't know anything, but that prologue was one of the things I held on to very strongly. Yeah, and so you really didn't know where it was gonna end. You didn't really know what was gonna happen towards the end. I didn't write the ending. To write that way. Yes. And so for me, because of that, writing is often rewriting. Mm -hmm. And I often think about the fact that I think about sometimes writing is what we're willing to throw out as much as what we're willing to keep. Mm -hmm. From the initial uh, version of this novel to the final version, um, I think there's only about 20,000 words that have remained the same of an an 85,000 word book. And um, uh, 88,000 word book. I don't even know how many words are in the final draft, but I do know that most of it is not there, but the prologue has been there in every draft from the very beginning till the very end. Well, and you know, it's also too, it's a brisk book. Like when you finish, it's like you, there were no words to spare. There was nothing mm-hmm. extra there. I feel like it's really pared down. And I think it's one of the reasons it is doing as well as it is. I mean, this morning I got a note from Book of the Month Club that it's the biggest book this month that they've, because they were saying, Do you, don't you want to win the best? Don't you want to um, get the best book of the month? And you were the best wow. book of the month. 
So when you see things like that, you realize that the, the word of mouth was really good on the book, but it's also held up that mm -hmm. people are saying this is really good. And I think it's because it's briskly done. There's not a lot to spare. And it's, you could tell it's been very carefully edited and taken care of because sometimes I'm reading a book and I'm like, there's no need for all this that I'm reading right now. I don't really care. And I didn't feel that the way at all. So well, tack off. <laughs> I, re I really appreciate that. So I think I have, and I've always had it a real, um, well, two things. I have a real gratitude for anyone who's reading because especially now um, in this world where we have so many things vying for our attention, you know, it's like there's a great New Yorker cartoon I just um, saw and someone's um, a woman sitting next to her, her partner He's saying, um, and her computer's open and the TV's on and she's holding her phone and, and he says, I, I'm going to botch this, but he basically says, are you all right? You're not watching TV or focusing on your crossword or looking at your phone. Like, it's like you have eight things going at once. Right. Right. And because of that, I feel like I, anyone who's going to sit down and read, I have such a strong aversion to boring them. Mm -hmm. And so I write always, I write with a song on repeat, the same song, the whole book. Right. And I think it does a couple things. One, it creates a meditative quality to my writing, but the other is I really do think it helps me write at a pace. And what I mean by that is like, am I moving quick? There's something about writing with the same song in my head that I'm almost writing to the rhythm of that song mm -hmm. and I keep things moving. I really, really try to do that. I, my number one goal is that when someone picks up the book, they're not going to want to put it down. Mm -mm. And my number two goal is that they're going to walk away feeling better having read it. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things I want to do more than anything. And they end up working. Okay. So you have to tell me, I was going to ask you later on, what is the song you played on repeat? Because I love this. Go ahead. Okay. Tell everybody what you did. <laughs> So for this song, it was If I Should Fall Behind by Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. And it's a live version of the song. Um, it's on their album, Live in New York City. And actually Reese Witherspoon's book club um, uh, uh, just made a playlist. If you go to their Instagram and you can see it and you can link to the Spotify page mm -hmm. and it, it pulls up that song. I've listened to that song so many times. So that's the okay. song. I'm being a real what I am usually not like that. How do you put a song on repeat that many times? How do you do it? What do you have? So it? in in iTunes, okay. you can just there's a little um line you can a little button. I'm I am the ultimate Luddite. So like you hear me saying line or button yeah. that you can click that lets you listen on repeat. Repeat. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's it's I really felt it was interesting that you do that because if I'm ever writing and I really just want to drop into a zone, I really like Simon and Garfunkel and I, I will go on YouTube mm -hmm. and I will find the videos of the songs. Like it's not, they may be the live version. Mm -hmm. And last year when we first left the office, our, our editorial director's name is Tom. Mm -hmm. And I was playing the only living boy in New York because it's oh. like, Tom, get your plane on time. And I was listening to all these different versions of it was writing because I usually can't write with noise, but yeah. if it's a song, I know I can do it, but yeah. You and say, oh, do you want to listen to this now? Not going to happen. Not I, interested. I feel exactly the same way. Exactly. But it's like, oh, I could listen to the only way we live in Boy in New York, 12 different versions. And it was like when we were first home in lockdown and I was like, and I was telling him and he just couldn't stop laughing. I said, I've now listened to like, you know, 10 versions of this. <laughs> so. And now you've also got these great chapter headlines that come in. Do you write those at the beginning or do you go back on those and those make little headlines? Those I go back on. So I usually write, it's a lot of them stayed, but some of them definitely switched. It's almost, again, it's that same thing of um, how am I going to, I, I like the idea that each chapter encapsulates something that's going to speak to the larger story, not just in terms of moving the plot along, but like in thematically, like you could pick up the book, turn mm -hmm. to any chapter and almost just read that chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the reasons I like titling them. Um, and then sometimes I go back and realize that what I thought that chapter was doing, it's doing something else. And then I change the, the title head. But I also love reading a book um, where the different chapters have titles. I, I just think it's an extra element of um, almost Easter eggs that you're finding. Yes. I felt like it was a little clue. It's like yeah. there's a little clue on the page. Let me go sit there and read the little page. And I was I, mean, I was going back and I was like, okay, what is she saying here? And I was yeah. doing that today when I was going back and looking for questions. I was like, this yeah. is great. So I also feel like you love true crime as much as I do because I just uh, love true crime. I could go down that little Netflix rabbit hole for hours watching those things seriously. 
Me too. Totally. I mean, I remember when season one of Serial came out, the mm -hmm. podcast, Yes. Um, my obsession with that, I mentioned Enron. I felt that way about Madoff, Theranos, anything. And it's funny because often with true crime, um, I do love a documentary like you do too, mm -hmm. but I also like doing my, I like, don't know if I like think I'm a sleuth. I like doing my own like research mm -hmm. about things. And um, I just think, you know, the, the, the true crime I'm most interested in is when you have humanity juxtaposed against hubris mm -hmm. and sort of seeing when did that line get crossed? Because like, I think about uh, Madoff or I think about um, Enron and it doesn't happen overnight. You don't go from nothing to a billion dollar fraud. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in the steps that one takes to get from zero of uh, wrongdoing to the little allowances you make that then all of a sudden you're involved in something so large and so criminal. Um, mm -hmm. And how do you get there? And I think particularly in this book too, because I'm always interested in the nuance. I, 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 I'm not the kind of writer that, um, and, and I like reading books that do this, but I'm personally not the kind of writer where anyone's all good or all bad. Mm -hmm. I like kind of living in the gray. And even my bad guys here aren't entirely bad. You know, there's a line in the book um, that I talk about evil and good starting from the same place, which is wanting to get to somewhere better. And I like to believe that. I like to believe even if you walk down a road that you shouldn't have walked down that result, results in harm or wrongdoing, that you almost got there by accident. You know, um, that's my hope for human nature. Um, and it's the allowance I'll make for people until there's enough evidence to convince me otherwise. Yeah, um, so, yeah. Yes, you didn't do that. You know, last night I was watching a um, special about John DeLorean, a documentary on Netflix, another one down a little rabbit hole. Yeah. And it was really interesting because I was watching and I was like, walk, walk, um, believing all their facts. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, they said he died at Overlook Hospital in Morristown. And I was like, no, it's in Summit. So I actually wrote on Facebook to people and I was like, look, it's that one little detail that now oh. I'm doubting the entire show. Yeah. Because I'm like, and his son goes, yes, it was in Morristown. And you're just there like, no. Yeah. Got it. And it's so frustrating when something like that happens because I was like, well, what else did you get wrong now in this whole thing? And I'm at the end. Exactly. Exactly. Now, all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to have to back this up and we're going to have to go through everything I just saw. I want to yeah. go through everything I just, and I knew where he lived. And now I'm like, did they say the right place? And it was just this, ooh, like, why did you do that? And it came yeah. up on the screen wrong. And it was like, so totally annoying. I just like, yeah. you know, don't, I, it just makes me crazy when little things like that happen because you take the book kind of seriously about yeah. like, you know, what you're, you're, you're reading. I'm really there. Yeah. Um, also, they go to Austin and we didn't talk about that at some point yeah. during the book. We're not going to say why, but they go to Austin. Mm -hmm. Have you spent a lot of time in Austin or is that someplace that you more imagined? I just, I, I really liked Austin and I knew that they had to go to a college town. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had been there before and then I, I really do. I mean, and to your point about getting things wrong in something, I am a research junkie. I want to research everything so that, you know, um, then you pick the right details. I, I, I always use this as an example, but like, if you know my um, father-in-law was a dentist and if I was gonna write about dentistry not knowing anything, I would just write about cavities because that's what you think about when you think about a dentist. Right. But if you actually spend time with a dentist, you learn so many more interesting details than cavities and you get to go deeper. And even then, if you're picking two details to write about the dentist with, they're gonna be more interesting. So to that end, I went to Austin when I was starting the book. And then I went to Austin when I was ending the book and I do the walk that Hannah and Bailey do. I visit UT Austin in a way that they do, which I won't mention. Um, I, I go to the hotel, they stay at all of it to make sure that I'm getting the interesting details down and making sure that I understand it. Um, and in terms of the true crime of it all and in the lawyers I mentioned speaking to, I make sure that I understand the different machines in place that would be involved in this kind of criminal journey. Mm -hmm. um, so that when I bring up something, I'm not just bringing up the thing that someone else would Google and find for themselves that we're going to a more interesting place in terms of details. And then we all take license, but then when I'm taking license, I feel like I'm taking it 
that I'm choosing to take it as opposed to I'm accidentally taking it. Right, right. And the locations have to work because I was thinking yeah. that in Austin, because I don't know it that well. I've only been there once. Mm -hmm. But if you don't say that you're going to go here and you're going to go there and you can't walk it, if there's yeah. a highway in the middle. Yeah. I remember one time we were at, um, I was out for the uh, LA Times Festival of Books. And mm -hmm. one of my friends lives in New York, said, let's walk to dinner. And we were mm -hmm. walking, I forget where. And all of a sudden he stops me and he goes, we're going to have to cross the 405. Is there a light there? And yeah. I was like, what are you? And there isn't. So basically like we're running across like where the cars are coming up the 405. And if you realize if you were writing a book, that detail, that one little thing would have made it completely wrong. Totally. And every time he's gone to LA since then, I'm going, okay, if you go for a walk, remember, <laughs> there's no light at the 405. <laughs> Stopping for the cars to just come off because you were an idiot and decided to walk to dinner. You know? Totally. But you know, it's so funny. I, I did, I had this great teacher in uh, graduate school, Richard Bausch, who wrote writes really beautiful books, um, short stories and historical fiction and other things. But, um, and so he also, he says something which I always think about too, which um, you could think about in terms of that light, which is, um, he says, if, if, if a reader writes to him and said, I don't want to misquote him, but this is the general idea that if a reader writes to him and says like, well, that didn't happen in Paris. He says, well, it happened in my Paris, which I love. <laughs> I love it in my Austin. Exactly. My 405. You know, this is what we're going to do. So yeah. How long ago did you learn that the last thing he told me was going to be a Reese's book club selection? Was that a, like big secrets? Like anything happening with the book? Nothing's happening with the book. Nothing, nothing. Else. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big secret. We're never allowed to tell that. Um, I learned about that in the fall um, oh, wow. a while back. So I kept that, I kept that secret for a long time. So when, when your parents call and goes, anything happening with the book? Nope, nothing's happening. Yeah, exactly. with the book. You know, not going to exactly. happen at all. I mean, I just love that. Um, so you're now working for the screenplay for the adaptation that's been op optioned by Hello Sunshine. And you and your husband are writing the screenplay. Have you written screenplays before? Have you done that before? So I've written a movie script actually with my husband before. Um, mm. And um, for another one of my novels, called Hello Sunshine. That's very confusing. It's not related to this. So we're in the middle of that. And But I've never written television before. And this is actually going to be, the, um, the last thing he told me is going to be a limited series um, on Apple TV. Um, and um, so I've never done that before. Uh, but it's, I love it. It's been a blast. And um, Hello Sunshine is just, you know, obviously they're the dream partners, Big Little Lies and um, Little Fires Everywhere. And um, all of their shows are so, so great. And um, it's just been really exciting to imagine a second life for it. I love it. Are you each writing an episode or, I mean, I've, I've heard a number of authors say that when they go in and they start writing for television, mm -hmm. you're, somebody is just doing the woodwork. Somebody's just doing the lights, the part over here. Yeah. What part are you doing at this point? So we actually have a team of about five writers who are brilliant and wonderful. Um, and he, everyone sort of takes an episode or two. So okay. J Josh and I of the seven, um, we're writing the pilot, which we wrote, and we just finished episode two, and then we're writing the finale. Oh, and then um, three, four, five, and six are written by our, uh, by the writing staff, who's great. And, um, but you sort of talk about all of them together. And um, what's so amazing about that is, um, well, two things happen. One, and I think because I've gotten to see how my husband works all these years, um, um, which is, you know, so great. It's, uh, it's so nice to be writers, but to be doing different things than each other, um, is that uh, everyone has all these ideas that you never imagined. So it's so nice to let your book have a second life. Um, and then the other piece of it is you learn not to be precious about it. Um, another teacher in grad school said once, um, aren't you, you know, someone asked, he had something adapted and they said, aren't you worried about people changing your book or messing up your book? And he's like, no, my book's right there. My right. book's right there. It's a totally oh, separate thing. And you think about it separately, I think. Well, David Baldacci used to say, just make sure the check is for a really big number. And uh -huh. Really big. <laughs> when they say they want to make the man into a woman, you look at the check and go, okay. Sounds good. Fine. Okay. Sounds yeah. really good. You think that's going to work? Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Well, we, we should actually say the last time I saw you, you were on TV mm -hmm. and you were sitting at the Oscars with your husband when Josh won the Oscar for best original screenplay for Spotlight. So yeah. let's just say that like the writing talent, the, the novel and movie writing talent in your family is 
pretty high up there. Oh, that's so nice. You two are writing together. I, and I remember that night I kept saying to my husband, there she is. I know her. There's her. There she is. <laughs> kept like going on his, his like, you know, row. And I'm like, oh, there. Oh, and he won. And he won. And my husband's like, it's like, you know him. And I said, I think yeah. I met him once. You I did. You guys have once. met. I think you guys have met a couple times. I think you met him at two different things. Yes. Um, yes. So, yeah. So, so he's, um, that was a pretty exciting night. That was, was I said, I think that was like a really fun night. It was yeah. really, really good. So you're, so you are writing the episodes together. So that's gotta yeah. be a real, oh, that's gotta be really, really fun. So have yeah. you spoken with Julia Roberts about, because Julia Roberts, oh, let's get, we didn't get that fact out here is the yeah. fact what is Julia Roberts is playing Hannah. So, you yeah. know, no, you know, no small thing. So have yeah. you talked to the actress at all about how you see the role or whatever, or no? No, so you know, we actually have been dealing with her producing partner. Julia Roberts is in production on something else right now. So we will, I'm sure, speak with her after that. But um, we've been speaking with her producing partner at Red Home Films, who's amazing and lovely. And um, at Hello Sunshine, um, our partners there are great. And Reese Witherspoon has been involved and we've spoken with her and she's amazing um, and so smart about all of this. So that's all. It's all good. It's all pretty surreal. It is really price. It really is. It's like, oh, this yeah. is so much fun. So now has the COVID, like the, the shutdown, the slowed everything down on this or were you in exactly the place you would be? Like, would you still be writing at this point or is that behind? No, you know, we just sold it um, last uh, fall, this previous fall. Oh, oh great, so, great. Um, we, we've been working with Hello Sunshine since last May and Julia Roberts signed on in, um, I believe it was, uh, the fall sometime. Uh, and then, you know, and then we sold it to Apple in December. So we're right on track. We're actually moving, um, uh, quickly and, um, knock on wood, we'll be shooting in January, but we'll see. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. But that is, so everybody, that is how long it takes. It is yeah. like shooting in January, which will air sometime summer. Like how long, how long after, or do they hold it till they figure out the right timing for it? No, I actually don't, I don't know how long after, but I don't think they hold it. I think, I mean, I hope I don't, I don't actually know. That's a good question. I don't know how long after. I know Netflix was holding some stuff because they couldn't put too much out because there wasn't going to be anything else coming. I mean, that, I believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They it went like, I think at Apple, they, same thing. They probably, you know, have a schedule in some way. Yeah, we have to parse these out a little bit differently. Yeah. So that's like really, really fun. So I understand also that you love to cook. In fact, I watched a video of you cooking Hannah's Redemption pasta on Instagram yesterday. And I am now going to make that because we like to cook too. And it looks like so much fun. So is that a go-to meal for you? And do you really like to cook? I love to cook. I think also working at home, um, which I've you know, did even pre-pandemic, um, though I sometimes then worked at a coffee shop and now I just work at home. Um, uh, it, it breaks my day. So like, I love even the process of I'm done working. Now I'm going to, you know, um, I was going to say be a mom though. You're, a, as you know, you're a mom all the time. There's no break on that, but, and it's a, it's the best job in the world in, in my opinion, but um, uh, it's a break for me. It's a way to, it's a way to say, I'm closing the computer. I'm done at least until after my son's asleep. I'm done until I'm going to have a nice meal. And I've always just loved, mm -hmm. I'm a terrible baker, terrible. Mm -hmm. I don't like the math of the baking. The measuring, and the, the science exactly. of it. Yeah. Exactly. But cooking, I almost feel like it's another art form because you can take liberties and you can try things out. And um, my joy, before I had a kid, I used to watch the Food Network, like Ina Garden kept me company. Like I loved, I loved that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I absolutely love cooking. This recipe I came up with while I was working on the book. Um, but my son loves it. He takes the sage leaves out as he calls it the leaves. He's the not leaves. interested in the leaves. Um, but um, there are certain meals that, you know, I make the strawberry pizza that I love that I've been making for years. And um, I cook almost every night. So I, I really do love it. I just love it. Yeah, we do. We cook almost every night too. And we definitely cook together on the weekends. My husband cooks more during the week because somehow oh, wow. I, don't, I don't stop as easily as I should. I don't, we'd be eating at 10 o'clock at night if it was up to me. And yeah. I think it's because for years we had the office in New York. So yeah. he, like if I got home and started cooking, we'd be eating at 10 o'clock at night. 10 but it's, but it's different now because I do really love cooking. And what I find is everybody's going, oh, we're so excited. Restaurants have opened. And I was like, I don't think my life is going to change that much yes. because it was like, we went to restaurants in September to support the restaurants. And my husband goes, we haven't done this since December. And I didn't really miss it. And I was like, yeah, yeah that's like, you know, really good. 
Yeah. But also, I understand your your uh, husband's coffee has become a pandemic hit because you can't go to that coffee yes. shop. So you can see it right right here. It's, it lives with me. So we before shortly before quarantine for his birthday, and it was like a gift. You know, they say give if sometimes you give a gift, you're giving it to yourself. I did not realize that, but we were realized we were going to the coffee shop all the time, and I got him. Um, we were, we love blue bottle, which is, um, uh, it's a, like a sort of a mini chain out here in California. And, um, I got him the small version. It was like a luxury gift, a small version of the machine. They had a blue bottle and, um, a barista from there actually came over and showed us how to work it. And then the world shut down. And so it was amazing that we had, you know, I, my drink of choice is an almond milk latte. And like, I get an almond milk latte from him every morning. It's like an act of love, an almond milk latte every morning. And he like, even can do like the little tree on the top, the barista art. So I love we, this. we joke, his grandfather um, owned a bakery and we joke, uh, or maybe not, maybe it won't be that when, um, when we're, when we, uh, put our pens down for good and uh, retire that we would open a little bakery, his coffee, I would make sandwiches, you know, um, but that coffee really gets me through the day. I love it. I love so, it. That is so great. And it was such a good timing on the present. Like, oh, oh my gosh, this couldn't happen one bit sooner. I know. I, that was later. Barista, come over with a mask. You've got to exactly. do this. Exactly. You know, Rebecca Lohman um, narrates the audio book. Did you yeah. select her for this? Because she did a really good job. I was listening to her yesterday and I was like, this is really good. So I think she's amazing. We actually, um, they sent over, my publisher sent over um, five choices. And as soon as I heard her voice, even one sentence, I'm like, that would be my choice. And I just, I really thought, I just love the way she sounds. I love the way she reads. Um, and I've become such like sort of a fangirl of hers that I'm going and getting other books that she's narrated too. I think she's say. really great at, at narrating. Yeah, she's really, really good. So was this always the title of the book? Was it always? Yes. Always the title. Always um, the title. Actually, is that true? No, that's not true. Um, it had was called The Could Have Been Boys at one point. Um, uh, which is the wrong title for it, but plays a role in the book. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when I actually hit on this title, I knew this was the title. Yeah. And it's just a perfect cover. I mean, it's I just- I love the cover. And, and I have to say that this works really well here. Yeah. The Reese's, that, that's very perfect. Sometimes yeah. some covers, they have trouble where it would go. This was definitely, you know, well done here. Yeah. And I just think it's got, it's got all the right vibe there. And it's got, you know, author of 800 Grapes. Yeah. I just love it. So what's next? Like, okay, so, because now- I have to ask this. Will there be a new song for what's next? Or are you going to do the same song again? There will be a new song. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I don't know yet what it will be. I'm actually thinking about writing a sequel to this. Oh, um, how fun. Which how will fun. be fun. And I have another book that I've been playing with. So those two things are, are what's next. Um, okay. I'm not quite sure what the song is yet. I, I am very attached to this one, but I think after eight years, I need to retire it. <laughs> let it go. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's on Spotify. You're like paying for Springsteen's house at the beach. You know what I mean? it's like, That's amazing. You know, same song over and over and over. Exactly. Exactly. You know, years ago, I, we parked in a parking garage and we were right next to Universal Records. I used to see this guy and his name was Pat. And Pat said, um, one day I said to him, you know, I see you every day. What do you do? Because I'm at Universal Records. And I said, what do you do? And he goes, I am the executive vice president of like physical and, you know, digital sales. And I was like, whoa, what a job. And he says, yeah, Carol, what, what record stores are left? <laughs> you tell me. Exactly. And I said, how many times yeah. you have to listen to a song for it to yeah. be like buying an album? Because 500 times. And I was like, oh my God. So I've remembered all this. It's like, that's how little money they make. That's how little ends up happening. So you have to listen to song that many times for it to eat. Oh my gosh. Fine. Yes. So you've really, you're doing it on this song. <laughs> you're helping enormously. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't know any of that. And that's, that's really so interesting. Wow. Learning different businesses, yeah. learning a different business and figuring yeah. out what goes on. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the sequel or whatever you're going to write next. You can just pick, I don't really care. Right. So just pick something else. It'd be really wonderful. I look forward to seeing the show because I always like to see how things are adapted because sometimes it's not exact and it's yeah. how it's reimagined and it still yeah. works. Yeah. So, well, I will definitely keep you posted on all that. And as, as usual, it's just such a pleasure 
pleasure to chat with you. So thank you for having me. I am so glad. And I hope sometime we'll cross paths either there or here. Maybe yeah. we'll be able to leave the house again. At some yes. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like, I feel like the, the, the bars are getting higher and higher. Like, okay, yeah. now you've done this, now you've done that. Now you can't do this, you know, so <laughs> yeah. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank really. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone, we look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to.